everybody and welcome back to my channel. I thought today I'd do a recap of The Handmaid's Tale episode 11 season 2 called Holly. Now in this episode which I watched on Thursday night, I have to admit that there was a lot of metaphors in the actual show, especially when they talked about the wolf. Now I'm going to refer to my notes and my glasses because I can't see. So if you want to continue watching me do this review, please do so. And at the end of the video, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Give it a thumbs okay, up. Okay, let's begin by looking at this particular episode in terms of survival. We see June all alone in a big mansion out in the wilderness somewhere in New England. It's snowing, it's freezing cold, she's about to give birth and she has absolutely no assistance. Elizabeth Moss is absolutely fantastic. This remarkable hour is what we see um, when we look at the wild, we look at the wild, the wilderness, we look at the, the wolf, we see the calling of the wild. In the last episode we see that June is um, stranded in a cold old mansion in the middle of nowhere. Nick has been shot, he's been taken away by guards, we don't know, and she's all alone. Um, when she ventures out of the house, she sees, she encounters this big black wolf. The wolf is very much a real presence in this episode, but it's also a metaphor. Um, in a flash, the wolf could have annihilated, an, annihilated June. The, the wolf doesn't. They, they see each other, they confront each other, they're looking at each other eye to eye, but it's almost like a stalemate. Um, the wolf is, rem, is a reminder that all humans exist in a, in a natural environment and all the dogma in the world can't protect them from wolves and people have this inherent wildness of trying to break free. Over the course of the episode in Holly we see flashbacks, it's intermittent with two um, birth stories and thereby contrast pre and post uh, Gilead. In the present June races to escape the mansion before her baby is born. Her desperate high stake manoeuvrings are contrasted with her first pregnancy during which she's surrounded by love, she's surrounded by support she's got a great husband. In the present she wears a handmaid's um, costume tattered from running around. In the past she would wear skin tight clothing. Essentially in case you haven't figured it out everything is different in Gilead and, and none for the better. As it turns out the mansion is Hannah's adoptive parents um, summer retreat. Uh, June sees her daughter's pictures, her paintings on the wall. She's still in trauma from separating from Hannah. Once again in a flashback she remembers dropping a weeping Hannah off to um, preschool. The show does a good job of rubbing in the lasting horror of parent-child separation. Since it's winter the house is empty. But there's a car in the garage. All June needs to do is hold tight and try and drive across uh, the border into Canada. This isn't the first time June sits in a car. Early in the earlier season, June tried to run away with Nick, but then realised there was no escaping. Now she's emboldened to move forward because she hears a little message from the official American government in Anchorage over the car radio, delivered through the voice of none other than Oprah who's broadcasting from the government stronghold and through the radio transmission she hears that there's been international sanctions imposed upon Gilead. Then we hear the Bruce Springsteen song Hungry Heart which is about a man that runs away from his family. Uh, like uh, Bruce, June is so ready to run away from the uh, toxic Gilead family. June has taken off her handmaid's clothes. She's wearing the commander's overcoat. She's almost out the door when suddenly, who should drop in but Fred and Serena? They scream into the house. They have no idea what's happened to Nick and June, but they know that this looks pretty bad. 
After a really poor attempt of searching the house, Serena emerges with June's cape and concludes that she must be gone. She's not. She's just hiding. Uh, foiled again, Serena. Fred and Serena are like Gilead's uh, twisted team rocket and they're in trouble. Gilead may accuse them of co-conspirators and possibly hang them. Wouldn't that be great? Perched on the second floor and looking right down into, from the window into the foyer, June has front row seats to the destruction of this marriage. Serena blame each other for losing their handmaid, not for the first time, but for the second. And everything unsaid between the Waterfords uh, is finally said now. Their first argument was who's responsible for losing um, June. And Fred accuses, Fred accuses Serena of being unnecessarily mean to June, not being kind enough, not being empathetic, causing June to run away. However, Serena accuses Fred of being a fucking idiot, sending her to meet Hannah with the father of her child. I guess Fred knows about the Nick situation, don't you? Then he said, she said, escalates into ludicrous territory. And Serena says, June ran away because Fred raped her. Fred says, well, it was your idea in the first place. As they see, the June watches on the second floor with a loaded rifle. She's pointing the rifle right at Serena and at Fred's head. The flash. She could rid herself of her tormentors. I mean, I would. If I've been raped, if I've been held captive, if, my, if, they, if they've taken my daughter away, if they, if they are torturing me in, in the way that they have been, I wouldn't have hesitated for a moment. I find this hard to believe. Instead, June trembles as Serena's resolve melts and she becomes a broken person. I have nothing. You've left me with nothing, she laments. Serena's wailing. She has no child, no Gilead, no husband. She said she, she did everything for her husband. For the I, I, I'm not feeling bad or sorry for her. I don't. June decided not to kill them, but she did see them break. The Waterfords um, leave doesn't mean that June can. She's stranded. Though the car works, there's no way for her to get out. The, car, the garage door is frozen shut. It won't even budge. She doesn't have the strength nor the capacity to try and free that door. And after she accelerates the car into the door, it, alas, it's to no avail because she still can't get the garage door open. So instead of driving away, like um, the start of an epic road trip, she goes into labour. While outside, in front of her is the wolf, which is still lurking around, like the unsubtle metaphor at this point. And at this point, June emits a primal scream that is an expression of all her inward trauma. Realising that she's trapped and in going into labour, at last she fires the gun. With three gunshots, she gives a signal that she's at the mansion. And so the birth begins. And this is the first time that I've seen a birth on television that is so intense and so raw and so realistic. We see her in labour. There's a flashback where we see her in labour with Hannah. Um, and um, Janine uh, in labour with her daughter, Charlotte. Gilead reduces women to this role that they're just childbearing, uh, they're, they're just as vessels for childbearing. Finally, she's giving birth without an epidural, in an all in natural environment, just like her mother would have wanted, though certainly not how she envisaged this birth to have uh, transpired. But even though June is giving birth the natural way like Gilead wants all the women to do so, nothing in Gilead's family setup is natural. When June was in hospital, she was surrounded by doctors, nurses, midwives, surrounded by modern technology. Motherhood was a source of uh, joy and fulfilment and pride. It still is, but in this case, it's absolutely war. It upsets the natural order of things. Uh, we should be calling June a superwoman. 
and she delivers her own baby. She names the child Holly after her mother. They spend a they spend a night together in the house intertwined and June knows that people are coming to separate them. But in those hours she's able to tell Holly the story of her birth. June's been talking to her baby all season and by doing so she hopes to imbue her with life, some memories of a more natural love. In the wild June and her baby are able to bond, bond freely like the animals we all are. They're about to go back to being socialised, Gilead style. I hope June's seed of rebellion are planted into little Holly's heart. She's going to be raised in a toxic environment, in a toxic home, in a toxic world. So that concludes that episode of The Handmaid's Tale uh, number 11.